I, I would like to welcome all of you. Uh, my name is Abbas Milani. Uh, I direct the Iranian Studies Program. Uh, we have some uh, special guests. I would like to welcome them. Uh, Bahram Beizai, who teaches uh, in our program. We are fortunate to have him. He is here with us. Uh, his wife, Mojde Shamsai, is here with us. Uh, Mr. Kamran Nozad, uh, a thespian of some renown, is here. Mr. Taib, who is a producer for this film, is here. Mr. Nasir Rahmani Najad, who is an old-time actor and director, is here with us. And if I have missed anybody, I apologize. I welcome you all to uh, tonight's event. Uh, this is uh, the event before uh, the last. I should also mention that in our audience, we have uh, Professor Brookshaw, who teaches in the Complit program here, and uh, has written uh, a great, great book uh, on the history of the Baha'is in Iran that uh, I suggest all of you who are interested to get a kind of a composite picture uh, from the literature to the laws. Uh, you should uh, look that book up. Uh, there is a translation of his book available in Persian as well. Uh, uh, Dr. Rahman has translated the book. Uh, but in English, uh, it's available. I think it's Rutledge, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, this is the event before our last event for the quarter. Uh, our last event will be this Monday uh, in our normal 113 Piggott Hall. Uh, Farzane Milani uh, will be our speaker. We'll be talking about her last book, uh, Words, Not Swords. I, I think the subject of tonight's uh, uh, film uh, could be called not the Iranian taboo, but the Iranian shame. Uh, I don't think there is any subject in 20th century history of Iran that has caused as much shame uh, and shame in the mistreatment of the Baha'is, and shame in the complicit silence of the intellectuals who claim to be advocates of democracy. Some of them went so far as to not only keep silent, but uh, condone the violence and the injustice against them. People from Al Ahmad to some of the leftists uh, who uh, basically repeated the vile accusations and the base uh, attacks on uh, this faith and uh, either stood silently or, uh, as I said, joined the attacks. Uh, in a very uh, excellent article in Professor Bookshaw's collection uh, written by uh, Dr. Shahabi, which is uh, excellent like everything else he writes, uh, the article is called The Anatomy of Prejudice. And he talks about how he, uh, he says we can understand why radical Islamists would have a problem with the Baha'i faith. This is, after all, a competition with them. This is a faith that claims to be a new faith, and they cannot simply accept this because the article of their faith is that the Islamic prophet Muhammad is the last of the prophetic line, Khatim al-Anbiya. And for someone else to claim a prophetic uh, revelation is uh, not uh, acceptable to them. But he says what is truly remarkable is how much the secular Iranian Democrats and leftists have joined in this attack. And one of the quotes that he gave, and I was, uh, to be honest, shocked by from reading it. Uh, I'll just share with you. Uh, and you can see the depth of this uh, uh, unfortunate uh, belief and unfortunate, unfair, unjust attack. Uh, it says, if the Baha'i religion had not acquired a political collaboration, and if the hands of the foreigners had not watered its roots, they would certainly have been buried in the nooks and crannies of the vast land, like the thousands of other sects that spring up every now and then in this or other corner of Iran. This is written by Adamiat. It is not written by some uh, unknown historian. Uh, so the, the film it discusses uh, the taboo on, 
the treatment of the Baha'is in Iran. Uh, after the film, we will have a discussion. Please feel free to have any questions that uh, you want. Uh, I have been fortunate to see the film. I have a couple of questions myself that we'll begin the conversations with. Uh, I think the, uh, this important question, uh, the taboo of uh, the treatment of Baha'is in Iran and the complicit silence of Baha'is in Iran, was fortunate to have a good director to uh, treat it, uh, Reza al Ramazadeh. For all, any of you who have been interested in Iranian theater, Iranian cinema, Iranian diaspora arts is a well-known name, is known to dare to tackle very controversial issues when virtually no artist dare tackle the question of uh, murder of Iranian opposition in uh, Europe. He made a film about it. He made a film about the fate, the tragic fate of Iranians in Turkey. So he is uh, familiar with the uh, uh, topical and controversial topics. And uh, I think it is the good fortune of this unfortunate topic, this topic of the taboo, that it has gotten Mr. Alonizadeh to direct it. So here's the film. Thank you for coming. Welcome. And uh, I hope you stay for a, a wonderful conversation. Thanks. I would like to, uh, I think, uh, I speak, I hope I can speak for everybody in the room. And thank you for wonderful, marvelous, sad uh, <clears throat> uh, film. Um, I, I think everybody wants to know, uh, as I do, how you got involved in this project. Well, um Anybody who knows me and knows a bit about my background um, knows that I'm very sensitive to social issues and um, problems that um, my country and people in the country have. And unfortunately, we have a lot of problems, so I'm uh, not as always, there are a lot of uh, subjects that uh, I have to choose one out of many of injustices that is happening in our country. So um, almost four years ago, um, I was reading more and more about the atrocities against the Baha'is in Iran. But um, if I have to give you um, exact date is uh, when I made a few uh, clips about um, um, women in prison, uh, um, about the rape in Iranian prison. Uh, then um, I received many emails from people who watched that on internet. And one was from Germany, from uh, a doctor, a, a Baha'i, I didn't know him personally. And he asked me why I have never done anything about um, this group of people of Iranian who are uh, under pressure that much. And, well, that was actually the beginning of thinking to do something. So I started to work on that, and then I uh, tried to make it for the BBC, and it didn't work out, and then uh, after pause, one year, I was waiting for that. And then um, another chance came up, and then I started to make the film. Um, I think, uh, again, uh, as someone who was watching the film, as someone who's been interested in the history of the Baha'is and the atrocities, one of the incredible aspects of the Baha'is is how still, in spite of all these brutalities, how patriotic they are, how some of the most prominent scholars of Iran are members of the Baha'i faith, including the Rasekh, Dr. Rasekh, that you, you know, he's the father in some ways of uh, empirical sociology in Iran. Uh, how do you explain this uh, 
yeah. continued patriotism in spite of this inhospitality that this yeah. nation has shown to them? Well, that is really um, one of the aspects that I tried in the film. Mm, let me tell you something. There, there were many things that I uh, wanted to tell in the story. I asked many people uh, about that. I received very, very good answers about whether they love Iran or they, because in, in, in Iranian society, there is a sense of uh, that uh, Baha'is are not really very um, interested in, in, in Iran as their own country. But this is completely other way around. And then when I managed to get this kind of shots from the people, the, the lady after all those trip all the way from Tehran to Turkey. The last sentence that I put there, she says, if, if I could, I would take the same train back to Iran. I think this says how she loves Iran. This is better than any other scholar telling this story. Or the boy, that young student who was um, deprived of his right to um, be a student in university. The last sentence he says that what I would love to do is to study in my own country. So this shows how these people are related to their land, what their, their religion actually comes from, from Iran. But this is another aspect that I didn't really get into that, I mean, about the religion. You might have noticed that I just, because for me, that doesn't matter what, what they say about the religion. I'm not a religious person. I've never been. I'm not interested in that. Any people has the same right, whether it's, it's a religious one or not, or this one or that one, that one. That doesn't matter at all. So as a human being, everyone has the right of certain things that are certainly familiar for you. I'm not going to repeat that, but uh, in this case, that is really painful uh, that people who really love Iran because of their root and everything, they are accused of uh, being uh, spies of the foreigners or indifferent in for their countries, and this is really one of the big problems of them. You know, there is one point in the historical point in the film that uh, I would like to take issue with, if you don't Please. mind. Uh, Mr. Martin Daftari claims that the attack on the Baha'is was an attempt to hide the courts for the National Front leaders and the communists. I think that doesn't fit with the historical reality. Um, when Mossadegh was in power, the clergy were very much trying to press, pressure him to throw out all the Baha'is from all the positions of government. Mossadegh refused. Uh, if you go back to the Constitutional Revolution, the clergy were very much active. If you go back even further, Amir Kabir, our great reformist, is the first person who bloodied his hand with the Baha'is of Iran. To reduce this to the simple politics of post uh, August 2053, I think uh, you know, flies in the face of historical fact. The clergy have been much more active and historically involved in trying to attack the Baha'is. Yes, that's quite true. But I think in this part of the film, in that scene, it's just explaining a certain uh, movement. You know that because, um, and the reason that I use that in the film was to explain the situation of Baha'is under the Shah, because this is the question, um, big question for Iranian non-Baha'is. Um, as non-Baha'i, uh, I know what Iranian non-Baha'is uh, have in their mind, the question that they have. I tried here to really put forward these questions and to try to get answers and to give the chance to the Baha'is to, for the first time, to answer somewhere which doesn't belong to them. 
I mean, they always can write something or tell something in their own radio station or television if they have any here and there. But nobody except for Baha'is are listening or watching this kind of broadcasting. But in this film, I thought, well, my audience is different. So um, I asked the question that the non-Baha'is, Iranian non-Baha'is have. Like, where does this money come from? Where all, all those properties there in, in, in Haifa, for instance? This is a big question. And Keller just used this against Baha'is to, to say that they, they get the money from the Israeli government and they are spies of government. This kind of playing around with this. So I, I didn't do anything, really. I didn't go through the history of this persecution and problems that you mentioned, the turning points in our history. It's just about that period of the Shah, Shah period, and that very, very specific uh, event, like uh, turning down this um, center of Baha'is in Tehran. And at that point, I think, more or less, what uh, Mr. Matin Dafari is saying is not, I mean, could be one of the reasons, if not the main reason for that, but one of the reasons. Because at that time, that was immediately after the coup d'etat, after the military coup against Mossadegh, and the return of the Shah, and that time, the Kalerjis were very, very strong. And that was the time that they could uh, do what they did with, the, with these Baha'is. But uh, after that, well, things changed. So more or less, that is mm, what he's saying here is about that specific uh, event in that uh, short period of time, not the whole history of right. Well, again, on that very moment, uh, there is now good documentation that Falsafi was but an instrument. The person behind it all was Buru Jadi, and they had threatened the Shah with exposing pictures of his wife Very and nice. the story of his having an illicit child. And they said, unless you do this. Yes. Um, you certainly know that. Even I, I, I uh, ask you for this. Uh, this is a very nice story. I went uh, after this, but at the end, I couldn't find this picture. And um, um, this, the picture that you're talking about was never found. I found every document. Uh, I found these uh, uh, memoirs of uh, somebody. You, you know the whole story. I even contacted um, uh, Dr. Milani for that, and I wanted to have there was a scene in my film about um, Mossadegh and Baha'is. And we even filmed uh, one of the producers, Uzirna, uh, he went to uh, New York and he shot uh, something that I needed from the hotel where Mossadegh was staying and the meeting with the Baha'is coming from uh, Chicago. Right. Uh, but after, after uh, finding all these documents and shooting these things at the times of talking to you. Then I decided to not to go into it because everything was based on a photograph of Soraya, the second wife of the late Shah, and uh, skiing on the water somewhere. Uh, but that picture was not found. I, I couldn't find the original picture. I, any documentary can't use another picture which is similar to that. So I decided not to use the whole, whole the stuff. Well, I, I think we can start ask, having uh, the audience ask their questions, if you don't mind. Oh, please. Uh, so if you have questions, please, there are two mics. And, uh, I, I would rather, if anyone, if any uh, fellow Iranian, uh, any question, please ask it in Persian so that I can answer you in my beautiful language, Farsi. And then, <laughs> then Dr. Milani uh, will do that. So I'm more comfortable because I can explain that in a better way. Because I have already always heard about the Baha'is, but I never knew anything about them. What is it that's so offensive about 
their belief system that the Muslim, well, in Iran, the problems happened. They have, uh, what, is, what are a few of their basic tenets? Well, you should ask the colleges to say why they <laughs> find them offensive. Um, as I said, I didn't want to get into the uh, religious aspect of the problem because this is something that I'm not really interested in that. Uh, mm -hmm. Because whatever the religion is, people who believe in something, they have the right to believe whatever they want. And no religion gives you any advantage, shouldn't give you any advantage or disadvantage. So uh, because of that, I didn't get into it. My, I have my own, own idea about that, but this is not the subject that I would like to get into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, dear Mr. Alamazade, at the end of the movie, you indicate that the Baha'i higher institution, Baha'i institution of higher education, BIHE, has been officially closed. I do have many relatives that are students of that institution. And despite maybe a very short interruption, the institution is continuing its work. Yeah. And there are still despite the fact that many of the professors have been arrested and they are in jail still, but the work of the institution is continuing as of today. Yes, this is a good news. You are quite right, I know that. And, uh, you know, the film was finished in Ju July, actually, yeah, Ju July last year. And uh, when we were uh, doing the online editing, the last uh, technical work on the film, uh, the, the teachers were arrested, so I ended up with this. But then, but this is quite understandable that Baha'i don't uh, just sit down and uh, settle it because they don't need anything. I mean, just they uh, they use the kitchen for the laboratories, they use the uh, living room for the classroom, and so uh, I, I was sure that they, they would do that in different ways. Yes, I know that. Thank you for. Explaining. You know, I think there might be others who might have the same question as you have. So if I'm going to give you a two-minute answer to your question. What is, what is it that the clergy don't like about the Baha'is? Oh, yes. uh, first of all, the Baha'is claim to have a new religion. Islam does not allow for that. Islam claims to be the last religion. It claims this prophet is the last prophet. They don't have a clergy in Baha'is, a faith. They have elected officials. That means they do away with the job of the clergy, which is not very uh, good news for the clergy. Uh, they believe in the equality of men and women, and the Shiite clergy do not. Uh, and again, one of the, I think one of the most incredible things about this, and this is mentioned uh, in Professor Brookshaw's book, is that Baha'is are a minority that have been attacked, persecuted, without ever putting a fight. It is a very peaceful name, religion. Uh, and they have never posed a threat to this regime. They have basically sat down and taken what has been dished out by both of these uh, regimes. And I think that also antagonizes uh, the zealots. There's nothing that antagonizes the zealot more than a non-zealot. <laughs> He said, this is really not my individual effort. Uh, I, I might have taken the first steps to collect what others who uh, contributed have done in making this film possible. There were a lot of people who, with equal uh, love and with equal passion, uh, entered into this, uh, and they began uh, to uh, uh, contribute. In this room, there are a number of people who are not Baha'is, who had a very prominent role in this world, in this film. Mr. Shah Muradi is the producer. He is a non-Baha'i. Mr. Monfarid Zadeh, who has made the music, is non-Baha'i. Mr. Daryush, who sang the song. I just had to give him a call, and without any expectation of financial help, he uh, contributed. Uh, there are others who are uh, doing very much the same effort. Uh, the people who filmed uh, in Kayseriya, uh, I guess it's Kayseriya, uh, they were non-Baha'is. Uh, 
I sent a team of filmmakers from Holland to Tehran to film the departure of the train. They were non-Baha'is. Uh, events like this have been happening uh, in other cities, uh, often organized by non-Baha'is. Uh, he referred to Orlando. Uh, he had some kind words to say about me. Uh, he referred to Orlando, where <laughs> Mr. Nogrekar... Uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Nogrekar organized a similar event. Uh, he's not a Baha'i, and there were an uh, equal number of people who had arrived. Uh, he has written articles. Uh, tomorrow, uh, he thinks, at Toronto, Mr. Hassan Zarehi, who is the editor of a paper there, is organizing something similar. He is not a Baha'i. He says that I think that this film has simply become an instrument for non-Baha'i -Iran non Iranians to show their affection and appreciation long overdue to their Baha'i compatriots. Uh, it says that was my initial uh, impetus in f making this film to show this long overdue appreciation and affection, and I think it has come to fruition, and that is exactly what the film is doing. خیلی ممنون آیا علم زده برای این فیلم واقعا نمیدونم من چگونه تشکر کنم از شما. It's began by thanking Mr. Alam Zadeh for personally what he considers to be a remarkable work. He had two questions. One, he said, a few years ago, a number of Iranian writers, uh, poets, scholars, had written a letter uh, essentially uh, uh, underscoring their uh, sense of shame for not having done anything about what has uh, befallen the Baha'is. Why was this film, what, why was uh, the letter not mentioned in the film? Does it have a place in a film like this? Though, too, though, uh, <laughs> How did you pick this uh, Moshiri poem, which is uh, what the uh, singer, singer recites? Uh, was this uh, a choice made by the singer, or was it a choice made by you? Mr. Uh, Alam said, well, uh, the film is, in a way, a response to that letter. It is our step to do something and to say we are sorry. Uh, and uh, in that sense, uh, the film is trying to do what the letter said we have not done. As to the poem, uh, the, the, the choice, in fact, was by the producer who is in this room, Mr. Shah Muradi. I had wanted to have some kind of a music on the scene where the train is departing. Uh, Monfarad Zadeh, who made the music for the film, uh, had used to come when I was editing. Uh, my initial desire was to see whether we could find a poem by Qurrat al uh, Again, Qurrat al is uh, one of the uh, first converts to the faith. Uh, she was killed by Nasser al-Din Shah during the uh, Amir Kabir period that I referred to. Uh, she is a remarkable woman. Uh, and we asked for the collection of her poems, but we couldn't find one that fit this. And some of the other poems of hers have been already rendered into music. Uh, but the idea of finding some kind of a song, Tarane, uh, stayed in my mind. Eventually, Mr. Shah Muradi came and said, this long poem by Moshiri has uh, parts, smaller parts, shorter parts that might be useful and eventually we reduced it to what you see in the film, or here in the film. I also wanted to thank you for making the film, and I, I agree with you that making a film as an independent person who's not a Baha'i has a very different effect in the world than the films the Baha'is have made, and it's with no amount of, no small amount of personal risk to yourself that you've done that. You're, you're part of our spy community now in some way. Um, uh, I've, I've been a spy of Soviet Union and then the United States, but that CIA for my previous films. Very so good. it's a privilege to be also for uh, My question for you is how can we help you publicize this film and, and make it successful and get it, get it out, you know, spread it, really? Uh, well, uh, 
I wonder, are you a Baha'i or not? I am I am a Baha'i, okay. yes. So my my request from my from Baha'is, whether Iranian or non-Iranian, is please try to get as much as non-Baha'is to watch the film. Mm -hmm. Your friends call them and buy tickets for them. I pay from the money that I get from spying. <laughs> <laughs> Just do the, do that. The fact is that I really my intention is that, especially Iranian, non-Baha'i Iranians, to watch the film. I know that they would do that in a certain course of time, but, uh, well, if it's not in 10 years, <laughs> I would rather have it in one year, the people come and, and watch the film. I, I think the film would at least make them think twice about what they they have in their mind about uh, Baha'is. Thank you. Thank you. من توی فیلم دو تا جریان رو به موازات هم دیدم. یک جریان این suggested that she saw two parallel patterns. Uh, one is uh, what has befallen the Baha'i faith and the taboo that has been uh, enforced about them and against them. Two is an effort to show how the Baha'is are trying to bring a culture of tolerance and change the culture in the country. Uh, and in spite of all the pressures, and in spite of all the persecution, they resist because they believe in the power of ideas. The older lady who says, uh, kill us, uh, we want to maintain our faith. Uh, this uh, belief, this simple belief in the sanctity of their faith is a very important part. Which of these two patterns were you trying to uh, pursue in this film? Mr. Al-Namazadeh said, I don't really see a difference between these two. Uh, I can tell you what my uh, impulse was. My impulse was primarily to show our non-Iranian, uh, non-Baha'i Iranians uh, that there is much that they don't know about what the reality of the Baha'is are. I'm not a Baha'i, but I understand the problems of the non-Baha'is with the faith. I knew that if I was to make a good film, I needed several things. Uh, I, need, I knew I needed to have a, some film from the village, the real village. Uh, it was, uh, the clips were done with great deal of danger to the people who uh, took them. I knew I needed some clips from the underground university, and I knew I needed a family, and it just happened that this family volunteered. I believe that without them, the film would not have an emotional uh, core. Uh, and uh, I wanted to uh, correct what I think is a misunderstanding amongst uh, our non-Baha'i secular Iranians. I'm not talking about the ones who have problems with the faith based on the religion. I'm talking about the non-Baha'i uh, secular, some of the intellectuals. The conception they have of the Baha'is is something akin to the Freemasonry. They think the minimum a Baha'i can be is a, a university professor or some capitalist. Uh, the idea that uh, they would have a villager, a simple villager, was strange to many of them. Many of my friends, my intellectual friends, when they saw these clips, they said, we didn't know there was a, a Baha'i who was a villager. They thought that all Baha'is are educated uh, professors at the university. Uh, I in, intentionally did not uh, fix the uh, mistakes that the exiled Baha'is in Turkey made. It was clear from what the young man was saying that he doesn't have much education. He made several mistakes in reciting a poem. His discourse was clearly the discourse of a person of little education, but I wanted to keep that. Uh, people know that I could have easily fixed that, but I wanted people to know that there are Baha'is who are poor, live in that kind of a situation. Uh, and the reason I kept the image of this woman, this old woman, uh, is because I wanted my uh, non-Baha'i uh, Iranians to know that there are simple villagers, women, old women villagers, or young girls like Mina, with whom I end the film. Uh, I want to say something that I want to say about you, 
Two days ago, when he was in Orlando, uh, at the end of the film, uh, he was signing books. He wants to also make sure you know that he does have a new memoir. Uh, it is available there, and he will be glad to sign copies if you are uh, so inclined to have a copy. He says, as I was uh, signing, I suddenly saw a young girl standing, uh, beautiful like uh, a Ghazal, uh, and I froze because it was Mina. Uh, she had come there with, my, with her mother. Uh, I embraced her. There were many people who were taking pictures of the scene. Some of them have kindly sent it to me. I'm waiting to get back to Holland, to my home, and to write something about my trip. And then I'm going to put pictures of this gorgeous Mina uh, on my site. And Mina is the little girl at the end of the film reciting a poem of the Baha'i poet. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, me, let, me, let me explain you something. Uh, I mean, this film is, is, uh, is not just a film for me, to be honest. I knew that from the very beginning. I know that every step that I've taken, I've noticed that this, this is not a film that I'm making. It's a very, very, very strong forward, a straightforward statement. Human rights doesn't have any, 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 any limit, any justification to <laughs> there are no limits to human rights. Every human being, irrespective of their faith, their gender, their color, their religion, their beliefs, must have absolutely equal rights. That's the very simple point of yes. departure, and that's a great point, place to end it. Thank you very much. Thank you. For the people who did it.